The Tom Woods Show, episode 2202. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, if you've decided it's best not to have your kids educated by people who have declared war on you, then consider the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. Instructors like me will give your kids an unfair advantage and an education you and I could only have dreamed of. But make sure you join through my link because only there do you get my $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, the great Scott Horton is back with us again. Scott Horton does so many things, and I try to list them. I try to list them in each appearance he makes. So he is, what, your executive director of the Libertarian Institute, on whose board I am glad to sit. So that's Mm -hmm. libertarianinstitute.org. Editorial director of antiwar.com. Even now? Even still? Yes, sir. Okay. So you got that. You got the Scott Horton Show. You're writing books like a madman. Oh, don't forget Antiwar Radio in Los Angeles. Anti-war radio in Los Angeles, 90 points, is it 90.7 KPFK? Yes, sir. See, I've been doing this a long time, Scott. I even remember the letters. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, welcome. I'm glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be with you again, my friend. All right, we're going to do a concise, ha-ha, concise. That's a, uh, what do you call it? Something is a contradiction in terms, a concise Scott Horton episode. But we're going to accomplish two things in this episode. First, I want to take on what I think is probably not an isolated opinion, but I did see on Twitter you interacted with somebody who said that NATO represents, in a way, is like the instantiation of the non-aggression principle because it's just a defensive alliance. And I thought, I really want to hear Scott actually give an extended reply to that. But then after that, we want to get back to talking, and I don't care if you feel like you've heard it enough, you have not heard it enough, We're going to talk about the worst thing that's going on in the world right now, what we can do about it. So, Scott, let's talk about, and I think you can illustrate this just through examples, but if indeed somebody said to you, well, look, NATO is not aggressively, I mean, NATO is not going to invade Russia, so it's just crazy to think of it as anything other than what it obviously is, which is a bunch of peace-loving countries that have organized together to keep the peace in the world. What would be some counterexamples to that? Well, I mean, just stop and think of it from east of its point of view at all. It's headed this way. Are you going to be part of it or not? And the Russians, of course, tried to be part of it in the 1990s and in the W. Bush years. And they continued to try to say, look, if we're going to do this security architecture for Europe, let's include us, huh? And there were Americans all along, including William Perry, who was not a partisan Democrat. He was a wonk from the Pentagon who rose to be Clinton's Secretary of Defense, said, we ought to bring Russia into NATO first and then bring in the states in the middle if we're going to expand it at all. Because we don't want to look like we're expanding it at their expense. Because it looks, as Putin would say, like a knife at their throat. And I can have a defensive alliance in the neighborhood. Call it the Crips. And then We expand this alliance further and further into your neighborhood. Now we're on your front lawn. But if you come outside with a gun, you're the aggressor, even though we're camped out on your front lawn or, you know, clearly what's always been your turf. And so that's the thing is a state itself, never mind an alliance of states. A state is an aggression pact, right? Or a a defensive alliance. At minimum, that's what it's supposed to be. As Robert Higgs says, all states are based on fear at the very least that a worse state than us would replace us if it wasn't for us. And so thank goodness that we're here to protect you from that. So in essence, all of these things at least proclaim to be defensive in nature, you know, in their origin or spirit or some kind of thing. But look at the actual history of NATO. I mean, I think Rothbard and I'm not a master of this history, but Gareth Porter is, and he's writing a book about it right now, and I can't wait to read it. And I think you probably already have a very revisionist take on all this, probably more informed than mine, Tom, about the origins of the Cold War in Europe and how I know certainly Rothbard wrote that the Americans knew good and well that Stalin wasn't coming into West Germany and the rest of Western Europe. Oh, and don't forget Robert Taft was against the creation of NATO. He thought it was a provocative move, and Robert Taft ain't no commie. 
Sure. And even Eisenhower said, look, if they're still there in five years, then we failed. Because the whole point was, well, we just got to keep the Reds out long enough to make sure that France and West Germany could build up their forces enough to keep them out. And then, yeah, they could borrow a couple of nukes from us if they really needed them. But basically, the idea was that, and I know that Justin Romando had written this too, that Stalin's idea was communism in one country, not world revolution at the expense of what was, in a sense, the Russian Empire under Soviet communism, right? They weren't going to give up their own country to try to take over the world that they were in no position to try to do anyway. And so there was a lot of American aggression and making it look like we were the defensive alliance in the first place. And of course, NATO was created before the Warsaw Pact in the name, again, of the defense of Western Europe, which they could have just left at that, but then they do nothing but expand it. Uh, It's a whole other side history here, but people know that it was putting the Jupiter missiles into Turkey that provoked the Cuban Missile Crisis in the first place. And then how did Kennedy get the missiles out of Cuba? It wasn't just threatening them and rattling his saber. He secretly promised to get the missiles out of Turkey and back down again, you know? So now, as soon as the Cold War ended, the slogan went out, and I'm working on a book about this now slowly. I'm sorry for the delay, but um, we're working on it. But they said, listen, it's out of area or out of business. In other words, it's the self-licking ice cream cone, right? Or just government program, just basic, you know, Ludwig von Mises bureaucracy, right? Like this is how it works. We got to find something to do or they're going to take our money away. And we don't have anything to do. There's no enemy. There's no Soviet juggernaut out there to defend from. So now we're going to have to protect human rights inside states. And I only realized this in the last six months or something. I didn't remember this from the time, Tom, but it was just three weeks after they officially finished bringing the first round of NATO expansion of Poland, Romania, and the Czech Republic into NATO. It's just three weeks later that they launched the war against Serbia over a civil war over the province of Kosovo, which had always been part of Serbia. And so this wasn't, you know, Saddam Hussein rolled into Kuwait against the United Nations you know, law, world law that they signed on to that says they promised not to invade across sovereign borders. But this is a civil war. And here we can't get the UN resolution to intervene because Russia has a veto on the Security Council. And we're talking about their historical kin and allies, the Serbs. And so Bill Clinton just breaks the law. He says, well, I don't have to follow the world law that America signed on for any more than Saddam Hussein was willing to. And so he uses NATO to launch the aggressive war against Russia's friends, the Serbs. And this does irreparable harm to our relationship with Russia right off the bat. And then, of course, and I'm sorry, I did. I wrote a whole dang book about NATO and America's 20-year catastrophe in Afghanistan. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, accomplished nothing. And what was NATO doing there? Killing people sometimes, mostly just wasting money accomplishing absolutely nothing. But as I quote General Eikenberry says, this is a team building exercise for NATO. Rumsfeld was happy to pass the war off to them. Oh, we'll have NATO run it. We'll put international, you know, European generals in charge, which that didn't last very long. But that was the idea was, oh, we're moving to Iraq. We'll let NATO handle, you know, Afghanistan. And then so it became, this is the self-licking ice cream cone, right? The more they did things in Afghanistan, the worse they made things, the more they had to do to try to make it right. And they kept that perpetual motion machine going for 20 years, for an entire generation. You know, the other night at my speech in Minnesota, I met a Green Beret, said he was there the first two years of the war. His son was there and came back messed up in the head over. He was a Green Beret too, like out there. He wasn't holding back at the base. He's out there fighting and came back not injured, but morally injured from what he went through over there. And he said his son was three years old on September 11th when he went over there to fight. And that's all, a huge portion of that, Tom, was, well, geez, we can't let our NATO partners down. They need something to do. These generals have tickets that need punching so they can get promotions and all the rest of this stuff, you know, that comes with it. And then now look at the fight that they've picked in Ukraine. And, you know, I'm working on a book. I'll go ahead and say it now so nobody else trademarks it. I better go ahead and like get the URL. Provoked America's role in the Russia-Ukraine war. It's not an unprovoked attack. It is an aggressive war by Russia. It's nothing like 
you know, proportionate self-defense by them or anything. They are the aggressor in this war. There's no question about that. But it's, as I put it in that original speech back in February that you had played to, the Cold War context in which this invasion takes place is all America's fault, not Russia's. And that's just true. Sorry, but look, we're only talking about Bill Clinton and W. Bush and Barack Obama. You think these men don't make bad decisions? Come on. These are the worst people in our society somehow become our presidents. And their national security councils too. I saw someone quoted you this morning on Twitter, Tom. Did you see it? No matter who you vote for, you always get John McCain. Yeah. And uh, that's how it's been. So what did John McCain think we needed to do? Pick a fight with Russia. Why? I don't know. Because Bill Crystal told him that he reminds him of Theodore Roosevelt. You know, something stupid like that. <laughs> and so, yeah, look, I don't really buy the construct that the United States of America, really any nation state, is ultimately just a non-aggression pact. I certainly don't buy that when it comes to this particular military alliance, which is just, you know, essentially, it's the American empire. These are our subordinate nations in the American empire. And you can call it a hegemony or a Pax Americana or a neo-neo imperialism, because neo-imperialism already kind of means another thing. But it's, you know, it ain't what Thomas Jefferson recommended. I can tell you that. (laughs) And look at all the trouble that they've caused. And by the way, I only just brought it up, but yeah, we could still have a nuclear war over Ukraine. There's an article by Michael Rubin who helped lie us in a war in the Office of Special Plans 20 years ago. In fact, 20 years ago today, that guy was lying us into war from the Office of Special Plans. But here he is at 1945.com, essentially saying like, oh boy, you know what? The Ukrainians have these big successes recently against the Russians. That could provoke the Russians into using nukes, right? Which is what the Russians have been warning this whole time. That, you know, this could go nuclear. And we keep saying, yeah, but you probably won't. We, the Biden government keeps pouring in tens of billions of dollars worth of weapons and apparently to quite an effect, Tom. In fact, I saw some of these Twitter hawk experts yesterday talking about it's the harm missiles that really made the difference here because they finally got enough Ukrainians trained up on these missiles that have a further range than the Russian rockets and give them an advantage here or there. Like, I don't know that that exact anecdote is right, but overall, it seems to really be making the difference. Well, that's really making the difference in a humiliation that could conceivably cause the fall of the Russian government, which the U.S. government proclaims is one of their goals. In fact, their ultimate goal, they've said that publicly, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense have said that publicly before. And at the same time, they also say that they believe that the Russians would never use nuclear weapons unless the existence of their state was threatened. Speaking of non-aggression pacts, it's state first, right? The idea is the state would tax and conscript every last citizen to protect themselves first in the name of who's going to protect you if we don't, right? Same thing there. Same thing on the Russian side of the line. We put them in that desperate situation, they could use an A-bomb or two. I'm not saying I'm predicting that. It is absolutely within the realm of possibility here. And then what does Joe Biden do then? Back down? No, he's got to do tough guy things or resign, of course. Haven't you seen Starship Troopers? We get a brand new air marshal in here to run this thing. If he's not up to doing the drastic measure. Liz Trust, the new UK prime minister, was asked, are you willing to use nuclear weapons? She says, absolutely, I would. And that was a couple weeks ago. So, you know, meanwhile, the counterfactual is so obvious for a guy like you, Tom Woods. What if Ron Paul had won the election in 1988 and oversaw the end of the Cold War? And what if Harry Brown had won the election of 1996 and 2000? And what if the whole 21st century had gotten off on the right foot, the whole Cold War era, off on the right foot instead of the wrong one? And we had something like a real, and I mean this very lowercase, C, confederation of nations, where we essentially all promise not to invade each other and work on trying to negotiate whatever badly drawn borders exist and try to make peace, try to move forward trading and, you know, form all that social cooperation in human action by Mises that we're always talking about. That's what we should be doing. That should have been the American mission for the last 30 years. And I'd like to remind your audience, some of them I'm sure remember, some of them are too young and don't know. I'm sure you do remember, not just Harry Brown's great article from antiwar.com from September the 12th, 2001, When Will We Learn, which is going around on Twitter. I posted it myself yesterday. But also his great Statue of Liberty speech 
which is what he just always would talk about, about how what America is about, regardless of whatever you think, what America is about, because he says so, because the Declaration of Independence says so. What America is about is freedom. That's what. And that's the priority. And wherever people disagree with that or divert from that, well, that's their error because that is the highest priority of politics in America. And that should be our role in the world is not being blood-soaked hypocrites, you know, bathing in the blood of innocent people, but actually being the good guy we claim to be while then also at the same time mildly berating the rest of the world for not doing their bills of rights good enough like ours, for not doing liberty, for having not firmly enough separated their church and state, for not firmly enough having guaranteed free speech for people and the right to exercise whatever religion they want and to vote in regular elections instead of dealing with some military despot or hereditary monarchy or some backwards 19th century way of doing or worse or older way of doing things and all of that. We could be the leaders of the world in that best Harry Brownian way if that was what we were trying to do. And instead, you know, we wear this NATO alliance like a bloody shirt. Is that the right metaphor? I don't know. Bloody rags around our shoulders. And just imagine just being from anywhere else in the world and seeing an American tweeting that NATO is a defensive thing. Like never even mind being a Russian and hearing that, but just about imagine being anywhere else in the world. Look at what they did in Libya. Did I skip the aggressive war in Libya where Barack Obama is essentially a favor to the British and the French and the Italians launched this war and the Saudis launched a war against their old grudge enemy. In fact, someone just informed me recently a big part of the problem was Gaddafi had supported the IRA back a generation, two generations ago in the 1980s. And the Brits had their grudge against him. That's why the Brits had supported Al-Qaeda to try to kill him in the 1990s. And then that was why they had America team up with Al-Qaeda, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, and Ansar al-Sharia, and the rest. The veterans of Iraq War II, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the Libyan veterans of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to come and overthrow Gaddafi and murder him in 2011. That was, again, the NATO alliance, supposed defensive alliance, launching an absolutely aggressive war. And this time they did get a UN resolution, but only because Hillary Clinton lied directly to the face of the Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, and promised him that this is just a no-fly zone over Benghazi to prevent Gaddafi from turning the place into Dresden or whatever ridiculous lie that they were pushing that Medvedev bought, which was another thing that was a major souring of the relationship with Russia there. This is when Putin was gone and was in the parliament. And he had his deputy, his right-hand man, in the presidency for a time. And this was Medvedev's absolute humiliation that Hillary Clinton played him like a sucker and asked for a no-fly zone and got a full-scale nine-year regime change. I mean, pardon me, nine-month regime change war with air and special operations and the rest to carry it out. And I'm backing a bunch of terrorists on the ground, a bunch of suicide bomber madmen from the last war, the bad guys from the last war. And then led to Putin's early return to power and harder feelings against, you know, America. So yeah, no, NATO sucks. And Pat Buchanan and Ron Paul and all of the America first types, libertarians and real conservatives who opposed the continuation of NATO's existence after the Cold War absolutely have been demonstrated to be right. I mean, remember back then, Tom, I'm sure you could probably instruct people a lot better than me. I'll ask you as a question. Could you remind us to tell us about all the scaremongering back then about how Germany and Japan were going to come back and take us over? The Japanese, they're eating our lunch. They're going to destroy us. Now that the Soviets aren't the enemy, we're worried that Germany is going to try to take over all of Europe. Come on. What a joke. That they would even try to make people believe that. And look at China's militarization. All of it is in reaction to America's militarization against them. Every bit of it. And that doesn't mean they're good people, but it just means we keep provoking them. Same thing in Eastern Europe, same thing all over the Middle East. You know, if the Ayatollah was one hair less patient than he is, we'd have been at war with Iran a long time ago over all American provocations against a country that means us no harm whatsoever. It's not even making nukes and not even threatening to. All right, let's switch gears then. That was great. I appreciate it. But now we have to move on to the worst thing in the world. As if that stuff wasn't the worst thing in the world, what we're about to discuss is the worst thing in the world. 
I want to talk about the war that nobody you know supports, the war that none of your friends support, none of them ever supported, not like the Iraq war where they all supported it and thought you were a freak for not supporting it, and then later they all pretended they didn't. I'm talking about the war most people don't even know is happening, and literally zero people you know supports, and yet it just goes on and on. Nobody you know supports it, and yet it goes on and on. There's democracy for you. So give us the, we're seven years old and we just need a briefing on Yemen. And then I want you to talk about what's being done to try to stop what's happening there. Okay, sure. Well, six months before you were born, in March, five months, pardon me, I'm bad at math on the fly here. Even though it's single digit arithmetic and I have a hand with fingers on it right here. In March of 2015, Barack Obama switched sides in the terror war. Before that, from 2009 to 2015, he had been bombing Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The guys that had bombed the coal, the guys that had tried to blow, uh, who did help to coordinate the September 11th attack, and who tried to blow up a plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009 with the underpants bombing attack. Real Al-Qaeda guys, dangerous guys. But of course, the more he attacked them, the stronger they got. That's the way that that kind of thing goes. They call it a surgical strike with the scalpel. But it's actually a Hellfire missile or a 500-pound bomb, and that kills innocent people, and that absolutely drives radicalism and recruitment and made everything worse. Well, he was also bribing the dictator of Yemen at the time, Abdullah Saleh, with money and weapons, and America's been supporting Saleh since H.W. Bush and the end of the Cold War and the unification of Yemen in their last civil war. And Obama's bribing Saleh with money and weapons to allow this to go on in the south of the country. Well, Saul's taking the money, weapons, and he's waging war on the Houthis in the north, the band of Shiites. And that's their tribe and political designation, the Houthis. The Houthi family is their you know, leaders. And he goes to war against them, but he's stabbing us in the back because he's actually backing Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood for use against the Houthis as auxiliaries to his army. But guess what? He's also playing a triple game and he's actually arming up the Houthis and financing their fight against his own army and the Al-Qaeda and Muslim Brotherhood guys that he's stabbing us in the back by backing because he's worried about his own army getting a little too big for their britches. And so he's diminishing their power a bit. Pretty backstabby politics over there in Yemen. A friend joked, that's why they have those curved daggers. That's so that if a guy is standing behind you and has your back, you can still stab him in the back. Anyway, so that's the way they play that game. Then comes the Arab Spring, right? Manning leaks to Assange the State Department cables, the Iraq and Afghan war logs, the State Department cables sets off a revolution in Tunisia. Well, there's already things going on anyway, read the book. But Tunisia and Egypt go up and then the rest of the Middle East starts having these giant protests, the day of rage protests and all that, the Arab Spring, some of which the Americans and Saudis hijacked and turned into disasters like in Libya, as we just talked about, and in Syria as well. But in Yemen, what happened was, Everybody came together and they wanted to overthrow the American-backed dictator and they did it peacefully. They all came together in the town square just on the Egyptian model. The Houthis and the Muslim Brotherhood and the Southern Socialists and everybody were like, hi guys, how are y'all doing? Let's see if we can work out a deal here. But then what happened was Saleh wouldn't go and somebody tried to kill him. And the second time he was wounded in a bombing and had to go to Saudi Arabia to the hospital to convalesce. And while he was gone, Hillary Clinton swooped in and she and the Saudis, instead of allowing the people of Yemen to write their new constitution and negotiate their new way forward. Instead, she insisted that they had to keep their vice president. And then I swear this is true and people can look it up in Google Images. It's fun to see, actually, you know, Hadi, Mansoor Hadi, election 2012 ballot. And there it is. There's one man on the ballot with one oval and one picture of his, I think, a picture of his smiling face there. Certainly, there's one name and one oval to fill in and no other choices on the ballot. And Hillary Clinton announced that this was the advent of Yemeni democracy, right? Well, Saleh did not retire to a quiet life of study like Mullah Omar or uh, like George Washington, you know, go to farming like Cincinnati or whatever. Instead, he went away mad. Are you surprised? And he took about two thirds of his army with him. And then here's the joke, Tom. He went and joined up with the Houthis. Turns out he's a Zaydi Shiite just like them, even though he's not a member of their party. So he joins up with them and they go to war. Oh, and then Hadi is provoking them 
by trying to cut off their access to the Red Sea and all these other things. So they go to war. Now, so I hope you're with me. Step one, Obama's bombing terrorists in the south of the country, but he's bribing the dictator in the middle of the country. The dictator's taking the money and weapons, and he's going to war against guys in the north of the country. But then the Arab Spring comes, and Hillary makes sure that the vice president becomes the new dictator. So the old president joins up with his old enemies in the north and starts marching on the capital city in the center. This is the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. At that time, our current Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, was a four-star general, commander of Central Command. And he was passing intelligence to the Houthis to use to kill Al-Qaeda. It's like, I ain't got a problem. No Houthi ever called me the N-word, right? Like, I don't, I don't have a problem with them, right? And it's in the Wall Street Journal and in our monitor, in-depth stories. Not even debatable. In fact, they even have, the Wall Street Journal even has confirmation from the Houthis in Yemen where they went and asked him, is this true that Lloyd Austin's giving you intelligence like we're hearing in America? And they said, yeah, sure thing. And so the point is then it was two months later that Barack Obama stabbed the Houthis in the back and switched sides in the war, Tom. And now we've been fighting for Al-Qaeda for the last seven and a half years. And so I don't know if a seven-year-old would have got that, but 14, I hope. Rewind it. Listen to it one more time through. You can do it. Get a map of Yemen and look at it while I'm talking and see. This is what happened. And if you want, read the book. It's all in enough already. I got a chapter on it. And so what happened then was the Saudis, essentially, and the UAE were very upset that the Shiite group took power and that the potential was that they were going to empower Iran there, which is really a hoax. I mean, they were friendly with Iran, but they're nothing like Hezbollah, where they're like, you know, sort of Iran's 51st state there in southern Lebanon or something like that. It's just not the case with the Houthis. It just never was. But based on that inflated kind of argument, and to satisfy the whims, frankly, of the brand new then deputy crown prince, the 29-year-old deputy crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who was also the defense minister, they launched this war. And the New York Times, as I've quoted before, it's the most instructive piece you've read in the Times in a while anyway, it's not a scoop. It's delivered, hand delivered by Barack Obama's administration based on interviews with 17 sources from the White House, that kind of a thing. And they all say they knew the war. And this is, double check me now, it is, I believe, the New York Times paraphrase, but it's a very close paraphrase of what they're being told by the Obama people. They knew the war would be long, bloody, and indecisive. That is, we don't know what victory is supposed to look like. We don't have a strategy, really. We're starting this thing. This is in 2015. After all the disasters in Iraq and Libya and Syria, and they're just, give me another one. Let's do it. And they even say themselves, they don't know what victory is supposed to look like. Long, bloody. That means people are going to be torn limb from limb by high explosives, you see. And indecisive. We can't even tell you how it's going to end or how you even want it to end. And then they did it anyway. And they did it, they said, because they had to placate the Saudis over the Iran nuclear deal. Now, this is, I'm not going off on the whole nuclear deal here, okay? You, people can look that up if they want. But the point here is Saudi Arabia was not afraid that Iran was making nuclear weapons. If they were, they would have supported the deal, which was restricting the Iranian program severely and expanding inspections and pouring concrete in the reactor and all these things. That was always a hoax. Iran ain't making nukes. They never were making nukes. So the Saudis weren't worried about that. What they were worried about was that if Obama made this nuclear deal with Iran, which is essentially just expanding inspections even more, verifying that same truth further, that that would open up the door to a new relationship between America and Iran. And maybe we go back to the bad old days when America preferred the Persians to the Arabs. And now Saudi would be losing their place as essentially number two after Israel in the American order in the Middle East. So in other words, they said to Obama, we need to be reassured how important we are to you. So the empire, in order to placate the client state, said, okay, don't worry. Which by the way, everyone go back to 2015 in your imagination here. There wasn't the slightest chance in HE double hockey sticks for your very family oriented audience here, Tom that Barack Obama was going to shake hands with the Ayatollah and make everything all right between us and them again. That was not in the cards. They were just doing a nuclear deal. And that took every bit of political capital he had 
to do that. So this is a completely unreasonable fear. But anyway, Obama gave him the green light to launch what they called Operation Decisive Storm, which turned out to be a genocide, a real no fool in genocide, Tom. And the thing is, man, I don't like alarmism. You know, this is why I did kind of say like, I don't know if the, I don't think the Russians are going to invade. I mean, I did warn for years they were going to invade. Then when they were actually going to invade, I thought, ah, maybe they're just playing hardball because I just don't like predicting the worst and looking foolish for predicting the worst. You know, I don't know. But, you know, and so I don't like throwing around terms like genocide, even when it is kind of like where like the Canadians didn't murder all the Indians, but they just took all their children and put them in re-education camps. Like that counts kind of, but it's, it's not the Holocaust. You know what I mean? I don't like throwing around that term like needlessly to be provocative or whatever. The truth is bad. I don't need to be provocative with like language, honestly. But that's what you call it when one nation deliberately inflicts a famine on another nation. That's what it is. It's a genocide. That's how we talk about the Holodomor when the Soviet communists stole all the grain from the Ukrainians in the 1930s starving millions of them in that case. But in this case, we're talking at the very least high hundreds of thousands of people who have been deliberately starved to death. Civilian populations in violation of every Geneva Convention and every American federal law of war, including in the Military Code of Justice and the U.S. Federal Code and all of the rest of it. We have war crime statutes. We don't need France and China on the UN Security Council to say that we're violating the law. American laws say you're not allowed to commit war crimes or we'll put you in jail. But those laws aren't enforced. And in fact, to be perfectly clear about this, and I got sources too, Lande and Reuters, and I forgot who in the New York Times, but you can read it. And they got great sourcing on this. In the Obama years and in the Trump years, Lawyers in the State Department wrote memos to the bosses saying, I'm afraid we could all go to prison for war crimes, for what's going on in Yemen. Our planes, our bombs, our maintenance, our logistics, our intelligence, our mid-air refueling of the fighter bombers, and our world ruling U.S. Navy enforcing the blockade. We're the empire, they're the client state. We are responsible. From Barack Obama's green light through every bit of this, this is America's war. But see, Tom, it's sort of like a lynch mob where responsibility is diffused. So everybody just murdered the guy a little bit and so nobody's got to go to jail for it kind of thing like that. That's what we're doing here. We give them the entire capability to do it, but then uh, uh, I'm washing and wiping my hands of that. They're the ones who are doing the doing. It's a brown Saudi princeling flying that F-15. And so it's not our fault if we refill their planes with fuel in midair and then they use that to just loiter around looking for targets of opportunity on the ground. In other words, killing innocent civilians because they have no idea what they're bombing. And this has been going on for seven years. And now here's the thing of it too, to be quite specific. From the very beginning and continuously, they have targeted the water, the electricity, the sewage, especially in the north, but really across the whole country. Apartment complexes and civilian neighborhoods, funerals and hospitals, including cholera hospitals right in the middle of the worst cholera outbreaks in recorded history, which I think means since World War II, but also then means worse than what H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton inflicted on the Iraqis during Iraq War One and a Half and all the sanctions where they refused to let them have any chlorine on the pretext that they're going to make banned weapons out of it, which is ridiculous. And chlorine gas isn't even banned by international convention anyway. Only America's, you know, end of Iraq War I sanctions. And there was no way in the world that they were going to do that anyway. But anyway, so the cholera outbreak in Yemen was even worse than that. And thousands of people died, at the very least, thousands and thousands. And that means almost all children, toddlers and babies that die of it. And they die of dehydration, of vomiting and diarrhea to death. And then an American F-15, like made in Fort Worth, drops a bomb on the cholera hospital where the starving babies and toddlers are vomiting and diarrhea-ing themselves to death. So we don't have the 3rd Infantry Division on the ground there in a way that might really catch your attention like in Iraq War II. We don't have a big, as you said, public awareness of this war either way. 
Nobody supports it, but most people don't oppose it because they don't know anything about it. But the people who do know about it, and this is what's really important and, and finally the point, the people who really do know about it are doing everything they can to stop it. And we don't have a single champion on TV news other than Kennedy lets me talk about it twice now. You know, we don't have like Tucker Carlson hammering this or something like that. We don't have a single star on TV who cares about this enough to talk about it. In fact, MSNBC was clocked by fairness and accuracy in reporting as not mentioning the word Yemen at all in any context for 365 days back in, I think, 2018 or 2019. They don't care about this, but people do. And to an incredible degree, to a degree that is absolutely amazing, inspiring, and probably beats, well, a hell of a lot of things. You know what I mean? Like you have, even when it comes to like school choice and guns and these crucial issues, you have Republicans who are good on this and stuff like that. You know what I mean? You, know, you have institutional power who support those things. You do have gun lobby groups and these kinds of things. This is all like from scratch. There's no Yemeni lobby. It's not like they have a bunch of oil and they're friends with the Israelis or anything like that. They got nothing. It's just, you know, some first and foremost, you many Americans who care about this, who are trying to raise attention. Then also it's all of these left-wing and progressive and religious groups and us libertarians and conservative groups too. I'm sorry, I'm unprepared. Man, I had a list here, Tom, somewhere. Maybe Scott, I can if this is, if this is unprepared, I think we would all love to be as unprepared as Scott Horton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, you know what? Oh, I think I do have some here. Man, I have a whole list that I don't have in front of me, but I do have some. Well, first, I can tell you off the top of my head, the National Libertarian Party is working with all the state parties too. And they're making this the highest priority to turn out calls and letters to Congress and all of these things about it. And I'm going to explain all that in just a second more. But we got also Young Americans for Liberty. They say that, and I have some follow-up phone calls with them to make, but uh, they have a big program that they're already starting. And they say they're on every college campus in America. They have 500 something chapters of Young Americans for Liberty. And this is a game of multiplication tables big time. So we need those organizations. And I like to believe, Tom, I don't know, but I like to think, and I, I think this is reasonable. I think that the Libertarian Party, probably if we, you know, it's 30,000 something people on that email list, whatever it is, I think if we all work together and all of our podcast audiences, especially you big guys like you and Dave and whatever with the big audiences, I think that we could turn out tens and tens and tens of thousands of calls to Congress and that that could be enough. That would essentially double the efforts of all the left wing and Quaker and other groups and who are working very hard on this. I mean, they're the ones who came up with this whole program, whatever, but they're working really hard. I think we can double their efforts. I hope Young Americans for Liberty can even double that too. 500 campuses. That's a lot of chapters of a lot of kids with a lot of family and friends and bosses and coworkers and bunkmates and people who can all get excited about. We're all doing something together, something that really matters and something where we really do have a chance to really make a difference. And so here, let me really quick just say R Street, which is a conservative group, like a balanced budget type group, I believe. They're on board for this. Freedom Works, Concerned Veterans for America, and of course, bringourtroopshome.us. Concerned Veterans of America, you might know as being a little bit more of like a Coke type version of Bring Our Troops Home.us. Well, they're great on this too. They're, you know, as good as any of us on this. The Taxpayers Protection Alliance as well and Defense Priorities, the Quincy Institute, of course, Antiwar.com and the Libertarian Institute. And we're all supporting this. And that goes for all you people listening to any groups that you have, especially nonprofit type groups, and especially anything with libertarian and right leaning, sounding names in them and things like this. Anything we can do to bring you guys on board to help support this thing. Because here's what it is, Tom. After all this ranting and raving about the situation, we have a real advantage to press right now. Just at the time that you and me and our friends were taking over the Libertarian Party and making it essentially overnight an institution as important as the Mises Institute in terms of potential, at least, political influence for libertarianism in this country, right? Just right at that exact same time that that's happening, last May, early June, right? We got a ceasefire in Yemen. And we're now in the fourth, maybe the fifth month of the thing. I guess it was in April they really first achieved it. So we're now, like I think, beginning the fifth month. Sorry about my math today, everybody. Help me out. Of a two-month ceasefire. Right? It's lasting. Now, it's not perfect. There have been violations and the Saudis are still not letting fuel in and it's problematic. But look, 
it's a huge improvement. I mean, it is absolutely a very real ceasefire compared to what was going on before. I mean, the airstrikes have stopped and don't let me go off, but just point is, it's a real ceasefire. We took over this massive institution with this massive email list of all people who joined a party because they want to participate in politics. And many thousands of them, because they want to participate with us, joined because we asked them to join to help us to do this. And we're all supporting now the War Powers Resolution in the House and the Senate. As Democrats have introduced it in the House, they have more than a dozen Republicans, including Massey and Gates and all the America First Republicans are supporting it. And so far, we don't have any Republicans on board in the Senate. Mike Lee, Rand Paul, looking at you guys. We need you on this so bad. You know it. And by the way, once Mike Lee and Rand Paul do come out and support this thing, then many others will join them too. But we really need them to lead on this. And they really know that. So, you know, earth to Rand Paul staff. Come on, guys. But anyway, we do already have quite a few co-sponsors in the Senate. And these are real, no fool and active War Powers Act resolutions. The one that was passed over Nixon's veto in 1973 that says that the president launches an unauthorized, unconstitutional, illegal war that Congress can force him to end it after 60 days. Well, it's been seven and a half years. And it's not just spitting in the wind because we got this done before in 2019. And it's true, it was Democrats mostly pushing against a Republican president at the time, but whatever. It still proves that it's within the realm of possibility, that this would not be the first time. It'll still be world historical importance. And this is a slippery slope argument, Tom, but bear with me. I think that if we work together on this, that we could be the margin in really getting this thing passed. And then I think if that's true, I think that Biden will have a lot harder time vetoing it compared to Trump, especially because it's the Democratic Congress right now passing the thing. And because I think he actually doesn't really want to have the war anymore, he just doesn't care that much and is advised that he better leave it how it is, that kind of thing. He needs this pressure on him so bad right now to make him call an end to this thing. And I think it's within the realm of possibility that our efforts could really help on the margin, which Jeff Dice says, that's where all the action is. On the margin, we could make the difference in really bringing this war to an end of forcing the American president to tell the Saudis and to tell the UAE, that's it, game is up. Congress has tied my hands now. You have to make peace with the Houthis and swallow it tough. That's what it is in the year 2022. And it's up to us to make it that way. And I got to say, and I know a lot of people are really excited about this. And I know a lot of people are really skeptical. I personally am not the kind of guy, Tom, to sit here and tell you, well, call your congressman, son. But I am one to tell you that if tens of thousands of us are all doing that together at the same time, if Tom Woods' entire audience is willing to participate in this, that is worth doing, right? And that's not spitting in the wind. That's really getting work done. And if we don't have powerful interest groups, then we have to turn out just mass numbers of communications. Now, here's the bottom line. 833 stopwar.com. Not 888 or 800 or 866. 833-STOPWAR.COM. Isn't that a great idea? And then guess what? That's the phone number. And you call and they'll connect you directly to your senator. It's just a robot voice. You don't have to deal with anybody. A robot says, type in your zip code. Bam, you talk to Senate. And then you talk to your congressional representatives, their staff. Connects you directly. But here's the thing. If you go to 833-STOPWAR.COM, I helped them rewrite the talking points. So now we have five or six important talking points at the top as far as like the facts for you, your background. Here's what we're up against. Here's what's happening here. Then below that, we have, if your congressman is a Republican, say this. If your congressman is a Democrat, say this. If your congressman's already good on it and find the list of co-sponsors here. If your congressman's already good on it, then by all means, call them and praise them. And tell them how important this is to you and how grateful you are for it. And let them hear that. This kind of thing has happened before, Tom. I know, I remember when in the 1990s, I read this in the New American Magazine. I bet it was by William Norman Grigg. Said, some congressman from California introduced a bill. I don't know if it's from California. I might have made that up. Some congressman introduced a bill. It was going to be a national law that said that you have to have a state certificate to teach homeschool. 
You have to have like a college teaching certificate to teach your own children at home. And it had a bunch of co-sponsors. I don't know what the number was, but tens of them immediately. And what happened was a homeschool mom group got their email chain and their phone list and their, you know how you do it with the phone trees and all those things. And they all called each other. And then they all just started this campaign in the house. And they essentially their message was, well, geez, if you won't let me homeschool my kids, then I'll just be an angry housewife who does nothing but sit home at all day plotting the destruction of your career until I'm done. And that's what they all said. Like, if you do this, you are absolutely making an enemy out of us. And look at how organized we are. We absolutely will end your political career at your next election, period. You'll never survive this. And they immediately unco-sponsored the bill. And the thing was never even introduced or voted on. And that goes to show that, look, it ain't perfect at all, but it is still in some form James Madison's constitution. And one of those things is these somewhat, you know, relatively small house districts, 435 house districts. And the war party can't rig them all. And they're small enough where even if the war party is trying to rig them, at the end of the day, money's one thing, but votes are another. And at the end of the day, it's the votes that keep, well, if it's not completely rigged, it's the votes that they need to keep their power. And so it is true that on the margin, not always, but when people are really organized and really work hard and push hard on something important like this with the energy behind it that we do have to push on something like this, it is possible really to get something done. And again, we did it in 2019. Unfortunately, Trump vetoed it and that is a flaw, but it is what it is. Of course, Congress could just refuse to fund the whole thing. They wouldn't even have to vote on it. They just have to not vote on it, right? They refuse to appropriate the money, but that's not the world we live in. This is the best we can do. And it is worth a shot. I know it is worth a shot. And you have to just imagine, think of the Libertarian Party. Forget all that stuff that you used to feel about this ridiculous, kind of weird, goofy cousin that doesn't ever get anything right. No, no, no. It's now us. This is our institution to do what we want with it. And let the critics say whatever they want about us. This is what we want to do with it. We also have a massive effort to push for defend the guard legislation, to use Tom Woods style nullification and interposition to get the state governments to prevent the national government from taking their guard soldiers without an official declaration of war from the Congress, which of course means never again, because Congress would never take responsibility for their own actions in that way. So this is a huge deal. And it's our friends that are leading it, but it's got a huge life of its own out there, the Defend the Guard legislation. The Libertarian Party, we're trying to do, and I'm not even part of it. I just am a member. I'm not in leadership or anything there, but I'm a friend of some people who are. And this is the highest priority. They're already making it their highest priority as well. And of course, geez, we got Ross Ulbricht to free. We've got 50 state governments that could be coining their own gold and silver currency. We've got innocent people on gun and drug charges sitting in prison that should be out. We've got all kinds of work to do. We got bankers who should never, ever get a bailout again. We've got anti-rifle legislation that we absolutely must kill on arrival before they get anywhere with that. We got John Cornyn and other Texas, you know, other Republicans are willing to sell us out on AR-15s. In our current day right now, we need a libertarian party that has our act together that's prioritizing these absolutely most important issues and figuring out ways that we can use the influence that we do have, the marginal influence that we do have. And I think, you know, I, I like to hope to see here that this Yemen thing is going to be a great test case for us about what we can do with this great institution that we now control. And that goes for all the other organizations that are participating too. I mean, hallelujah. It ain't just the LP. It's all these other groups too. And I know there's been some controversy about YAL, but I asked them to help us with this. And they said, absolutely, we're at your service. Let's do it. So, you know, all positivity and hell, I might even make some calls to my friends at Cato. All right. Well, look, it's very easy to do, as Scott says, 833stopwar.com. And as he says, that's also the phone number. So 833stopwar. It's only going to take you a minute. And there's a huge humanitarian catastrophe that has taken place that we want to put a stop to once and for all. And if in exchange for doing that, you're out three minutes of your time, it seems like a pretty good deal. So of course, I will link to this on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2202, in case you don't remember it, but try to remember it, 833-STOP-WAR. 
Com. Maybe, maybe for once, we can actually accomplish something that's really, really important. We appreciate your tireless leadership on this, Scott, going around and just bashing everybody over the head that, look, we have a lot of things we have to focus on, but this one is potentially winnable if we just work on it right now. So thank yeah. you for doing that. Thank you so much, Tom. And look, I mean, I'm from here. I'm not against my country. I just hate my government, right? That's I'm pretty much speaking for everybody listening to this show too, pretty much. This is the worst thing about our government. It's just absolutely an atrocity. So this is our chance. All right, let's go do it. 833stopwar.com. And our thanks, of course, to Scott Horton. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, sir. All right, folks, that's going to do it for today. I know it's already a big chunk of the way into September, but there are still people who start the school year a little bit on the late side, you homeschoolers. So remember, if you're thinking of using the Ron Paul curriculum, which is self-taught and great and has got courses from me, then you should, of course, join the curriculum through me because only through me do you get all my bonuses. And there are some great bonuses. Well, I, I'll just send you over to the website to see what the bonuses are, but they're very much worth your while. So make sure you join through ronpaulhomeschool.com. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.